Why, hello there. You are listening to the Earful Tower podcast. I go by the name of Oliver G. This is a show about Paris, France. Usually I uh, I interview someone for the show, but uh, this week and the surrounding weeks, I'm going through my audio experience for Paris on Air, which is a book I wrote in 2020. I think you already knew that. The show is fiercely independent. No sponsors here, but it is brought to you by the kindly folks who have taken the plunge and become a member on Patreon. I say taking the plunge like it's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. If you're enjoying the show, uh, check it out. Open up all the extra sort of secret corridors of content at patreon.com slash the earful tower. This week, there's a scroll that goes with this episode in which I've twisted Lena's arm to reveal the banana bread recipe. Uh, from halfway through the chapter. Also, Eddie, my brother, who puts together these scrolls, has, uh, I don't know how he did it, but he found pictures I don't think I've ever seen before uh, from Finding Mary, the chapter you're about to hear, which was my first trip to Paris. In fact, and he's trying to twist my arm into sharing it. I haven't decided yet if I will. Uh, There's a video that I filmed from the top of the Eiffel Tower when he was a young 12, but I was a young whatever, 21, uh, I'm doing a French accent, pointing out all sorts of things from the top of there. I had no idea this was my trip to Paris. Funny to think how far things have come, but all that will be on Patreon. Now, this chapter that you're about to hear is kind of fun. It's It takes a sort of quicker pace, I think, than the other ones, which were a little bit more passive, which is sort of what was happening to me in France and what was happening around me. Now, uh, you're going to hear as I started making things happen myself, live shows, Uh, tracking down people, learning more about the country through uh, cheese, crocodile hunting, all sorts of things, and a very viral video too. So this is sort of uh, getting into the early stages of the Earful Tower. I'm not going to go on about it. You're about to hear it, but I will leave on this note. Thank you very much to everyone who's been listening to this audio experience so far. I wondered if it would happen, and it has started to happen. People sending in uh, emails telling me about you know being on long road trips and listening to it and uh, so on. And that warms my heart. Keep them coming. In fact, the best thing you could do if you're enjoying it is leave it as a review on uh, the review page. And the reason I ask this is so that anyone joining in now late and wondering what's going on, will be uh, reassured by your uh, reviews saying that you're enjoying it. I'll read one of them at the very end from Arizona. Uh, But for now, Chapter 6 of Paris on Air. Enjoy! Chapter 6. Chasing Crocodiles, Understanding Cheese, and Making a Viral Video. 6.1. Live Shows. I was very hungry as I approached 18 Rue de Lodion, but as Ernest Hemingway said in A Movable Feast, you can enjoy Paris more when you're hungry. He said the hunger made you appreciate the art, as if you could feel the same hunger the artists were feeling when they were working. But in my own hunger, Paris looked the same to me. All I could think about was how I needed some food, and how I needed some money to buy some food, and how I needed a way to make money. My first money-making scheme was to experiment with live shows in Paris with a paying crowd and an entertaining guest. And my first target was John Baxter, an Australian author who'd been living in Paris for decades and could tell a story better than just about anyone I knew. He'd invited me to discuss my plan at his apartment on the left bank, which had sweeping views over the city from the Notre Dame Cathedral to Sacré-Cœur. When Baxter opened the door, I let it slip that I was hungry. In fact, I didn't let it slip. I asked him if he had anything to eat. Forget Hemingway and his romanticism, I needed a little morsel of something, even a piece of bread. Baxter, something of a chef on the side, took pity on my Oliver Twist routine and rustled up a quick feast, and then we got to talking. I said we got to talking, it was more him talking, but that was fine by me. He was much more interesting than me, and I was happy to listen. He told tales of his travels, his books, his lovers, and Paris, and I gobbled it up. This was the Paris I wanted to experience. And I gobbled it up. Chewing the fat with a prolific author on his balcony overlooking Paris. Eventually, he asked what I had planned for the live show, and I managed to convince him to be my guest. He'd already been on my podcast, and he said he wanted to see it succeed, adding that he didn't expect a cut of any of the profits from tickets. I'd already arranged a venue for the show, down at the headquarters of a tour company by Notre Dame, nestled on the riverbank somewhere between the Tour d'Argent restaurant and the Shakespeare and Company bookshop. 
Baxter told me that Sylvia Beach, who started the original Shakespeare and Company bookshop, had once lived in his apartment block, and that Hemingway would often come to visit her. I went home and skimmed through A Movable Feast and marveled to see that I'd been walking the same steps as Hemingway that day. The only difference was that a hungry Hemingway refused the food, and I asked for it. So, here it was, a live show, my first real money-making plan since I quit my full-time job. I could sell tickets. Imagine if I could sell tickets for 20 euros, and imagine if I sold 50 of them. Would it be possible? That'd be a thousand euros. Now, with a thousand euros coming in, I could surely buy some nice food and drinks for the guests, right? It was strange to think that 1,000 euros could be so exciting, considering I'd been earning much more than that at the news site. But this would be my own earnings, all from my own ideas, something out of nothing. Empowered by this wild scheme, I forgot one crucial aspect of the event planning. 20 euros is a lot of money to spend to watch someone talk. Heck, for 20 euros you can get tickets to see the top athletes in the world perform in front of a sold-out arena. So why would you want to see me and John Baxter talking about Paris, even if there was a glass of champagne thrown in? Perhaps predictably for anyone besides me, tickets were slow to sell. In fact, they hardly sold at all. I emailed all my friends and acquaintances, but the sales dribbled in at best. Eventually, I realized that it would never sell out. I was far too small a voice on the Paris scene to gather a paying crowd. But just as I was about to invite everyone to come for free, thinking that a non-paying crowd is better than no crowd, I got an unexpected email from a lady in Dallas. Hi, Oliver. I heard you're having trouble selling tickets to your show. Well, I love the Earful Tower, and if you promise to make a recording of the evening, then I will buy a ticket and donate it to anyone in Paris who wants to come. What an inspiring email. I was ecstatic. It never occurred to me that I could sell tickets to people who couldn't physically be there. The weight of imminent failure was lifted off my shoulders, and I set about emailing listeners abroad who I knew loved the show. I told them that if they wanted to donate a ticket, I'd be happy to record the chat with Baxter. And those lovely listeners responded. One of them bought five tickets. When the day for the show rolled around, I'd sold 40 tickets, mostly to people who'd never make it to the event and had no intention to. I gave the spots away to anyone who wanted them. And would you believe it, 40 people crammed into the little room to watch the show. Those who got donated tickets brought treats from home and an Australian mate of mine, Mike, even baked cakes. The owners of the venue managed to sell drinks to guests, Baxter sold a few books, and everyone was happy. The show itself was a hit, and Baxter was in fine form. It was lucky he'd said he didn't want to cut at the profits, because there weren't many, not after the food and champagne I bought. But with a belly full of admittedly cheap champagne and finger foods, I wasn't hungry anymore. At least not for food. But I was hungry to see where I could take the show. If I could sell tickets to a Paris event to people in Dallas, then surely there was a way to make this podcast succeed. Six point two The Crocodiles. You might know the Canal Saint-Martin from the stone-skimming scene in the hugely popular movie Amélie. Or, you might be familiar with it as a popular Paris hangout for youngsters and hipsters. But did you know there's at least one massive beaver in there? I swear it's true. I saw it with my own eyes. In fact, a group of us saw it swimming along without a care in the world. I was beside myself with excitement, running along the canal like an excited dog. Now, the reason I cared so much about this beaver is because I'm Australian. One of the things I miss the most about Australia, by far, is the wild animals. Where I lived in Perth, it wasn't unusual to see birds, tortoises, lizards, or snakes. Travel a little further out of the city and you see more kangaroos than you could imagine, plus emus, sharks, seals, dolphins, stingrays, and even penguins. In Paris, all I got was rats, which I quite like to watch, to Lena's disgust. So, after years of only rats and domesticated dogs, imagine the thrill of seeing a real live beaver, which was as exotic to me as a kangaroo was to a Parisian. I told a few people in the following days about the beaver sighting, and they all scoffed. A beaver in the canal? Impossible. I researched the mysterious animal and found that it was most likely a koipu, which is basically as close to a beaver as you can get without being a beaver. Just add a rat tail and you've got it. 
But what intrigued me far, far more than the beaver, was the idea that people were so adamantly against the notion of any animal living in the canal. It was so puzzling to me and made me want to dig deeper. The whole thing had an almost conspiratorial edge to it. What was the canal really hiding? I told the story to a British video maker and let him know how everyone doubted it. His eyes lit up. He'd also been itching to tell a story, to uncover a secret of Paris. So we set our minds to figure out exactly what this mysterious creature could have been. We went down to the canal to interview some locals about whether they'd seen the beaver, or indeed whether they believed in it. Most people laughed it off. One, rather worryingly, said he'd heard council workers had recently found a body at the bottom of the canal, though that turned out to be wrong. One thing was clear, no one had seen the beaver, and we seemed no closer to an answer until the last interview of the day blew the entire story out of the water. I came across an elderly lady who was sitting on a bench by the canal, looking wistfully over the water. I didn't mention the beaver at first, and recorded our conversation about the canal. She said she just liked to sit there and watch the water, something I could relate to all too well. Eventually, I turned the subject to animals. Did she think, perhaps, that any creatures could live in the canal? She looked down to the water again, a mischievous twinkle in her eyes, then paused and looked straight into my very soul. I know there can't really have been a fire in her eyes, that would be impossible, but I swear I saw some kind of flame. Someone told me that there is an enormous beaver, a castor. Oh, it would be nice. You don't think so? I don't know. But do you think it's possible? Yes, why not? Well, a lot of people say it's impossible. I know there is crocodiles. I know. How do you know that? I put them. You put them in there. But it's, it's a secret. Shh. I put two of them here. Did you really? Yes, it is real. You honestly put two crocodiles yes, into but the canal? Yes. Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. Crocodiles? Did she say crocodiles? I almost laughed. At first I thought she'd mistranslated the word for crocodile. Maybe she meant lizard. But the word was the same in both languages. The woman wasn't anywhere near laughing. She was deadly serious. I had a hundred questions. I asked them all. I've listened to the full recording of our conversation and my tone changes gradually from sheer incredulousness to astonishment to baffled intrigue. The lady said she'd had two pet crocodiles and had decided to release them into the canal for a better life. She'd done it a year earlier after council workers had emptied and dredged the canal, as they do every 15 years or so. In other words, if the lady was telling the truth, and I honestly believe she was, then perhaps the crocs could go undiscovered for years. Of course, the crocodile claim changed the whole plot of our beaver story. In fact, the beaver angle went out the window. I followed the crocodile trail instead, which led me to the mayor of the 4th arrondissement, who told me the tale of another famous crocodile discovered in the Paris sewers in the mid-1980s. That croc was captured by firefighters and sent to an aquarium in the French countryside. That part was true. I found the old news stories to prove it. But at this point, I was far more interested in the new crocs and whether they could possibly survive in the murky depths of Paris. A marine biologist told me he was confident that if they indeed existed, two young crocodiles could thrive in such conditions. Imagine, he said, if it was a male and female, they could become a mating pair. He said young crocs like that would grow quickly and could already be a meat along with an appetite for rats or beavers. I honestly hope the story is true and that there are two growing crocs lurking in the Paris canals. I've always thought the canal needed a little extra something to liven it up, and two crocodiles would certainly do the trick. The hipster Parisians wouldn't be so quick to dip their toes into the water now, would they? I like the story of the crocodiles so much that when we'd finished with all the interviews, we put it together as a podcast episode and performed it live in Paris. I rented a big room in a canal-side bar and invited a crowd to hear a monstrously good story. That was all I told them. I didn't want to give away any of the plot details. This time I charged 10 euros per ticket, and about 70 people showed up. But that story had a longer tale than the rest of them. For months afterwards, I got emails from people saying they couldn't look at the canal the same way. A year later, a tour guide stopped me in the street to thank me for his go-to canal story for tourists. The Paris Crocodiles made it to national radio in Australia, and the pages of a book about Paris. As for me, that crocodile story became one of my favourites, but it also taught me something valuable. While Paris is overflowing with some excellent tales from the history books, there are also plenty of new stories to be told. 
You just gotta ask the right questions to find them. Six point three, Le Peloton Café. So where would a young Hemingway hang out if he was in Paris today? I often wonder. If you read his books about Paris, you'll see he spent a lot of time at what are now the famous cafes on the left bank. These places have become so popular, so touristy, so expensive. I feel there's no way Hemingway would ever step foot in them today. You know, I doubt he'd even have been on the left bank at all if he was down and out in Paris nowadays. So where would he be? If I had to guess, I'd say the eleventh hour on this one. Maybe the up and coming nineteenth or twentieth. He probably wouldn't even be in Paris. More likely in a nondescript French town where accommodation is affordable and beers are cheap. As for me, I realized I was inadvertently following in Hemingway's footsteps once again. Just like he did, I'd quit my paying journalism job and tried to make it on my own in Paris. But one thing was missing: I didn't yet have a regular cafe of my own. Mine turned out to be Le Peloton. A spot owned by a pair of Anglophone expats, Paul and Christian, who were looking for a finishing point for their popular bike tours. I can't remember how I found the cafe, but I remember why I came back. It had everything I was looking for: a great location by the Seine River that wasn't far from my basketball court, English-speaking staff and customers, and good coffee. It was around a thirty-minute walk from my apartment, something I also liked, as I remained a big fan of the aimless walk in Paris. But there was one big problem. I still had essentially no income, and the coffees were four euros a hit. A struggling podcaster can't hole up in the corner of a cafe with those prices. The brainwave came, as most of my Paris brainwaves apparently do, over a canal-side picnic with the cafe owners, who were halfway through one of Lena's banana bread cakes. What if we could organize a barter system, one of Lena's cakes in return for free coffee? We agreed that every time Lena brought in a banana bread. They'd give us ten coffees, and what do you know? The bread sold like hotcakes. So Lena kept making it. At one point, the cafe owed us eighty coffees. For the price of a few bananas, sugar, and flour, Lena and I had a regular coffee shop hangout, and I had a working space. It was at Le Peloton that I'd have meetings, edit podcast episodes, or just enjoy some downtime. I was no stranger to sharing that information on the podcast, and it turned out people were listening. One day, I was sitting at the corner of the cafe when a tourist walked in, scouted the room with wide eyes. Is that Oliver's red scooter? Is he here? I could swear I heard her talk about the red scooter to one of the owners, and then I watched as he pointed towards me. The woman approached, sidled up next to me at the bar, and said, "I hoped you'd be here." It took me by surprise. Who was this woman, and what did she want from me? She continued. I've listened to every single episode of your show, and I've been to this cafe twice, hoping to meet you. We got chatting, and she revealed that she'd planned her vacation in Paris around the podcast. She knew my Paris, had eaten where I recommended, visited my favorite sites, and done walking tours with the guides I'd had on the show. She added that she was leaving the next day and had done everything on her bucket list. All but one thing, it turned out, one burning question that remained. She lowered her voice. So. You have to tell me. Was the crocodile story true? I told her that I believed it was true, and her eyes lit up. Well, that's the one thing I haven't done. I want to explore the Canal Saint Martin. I want to find the crocodiles. Without a second's thought, I said I'd show her the canal right then and there if she'd book one of my walking tours. I had no idea why I said that, as I didn't do walking tours. I'd never given a walking tour before. She asked me how much I charged. My mind raced. How much did I charge? Out of nowhere, I said one hundred euros. Will you show me where the crocodiles were released? She asked tentatively. Was she kidding? For a hundred euros, I'd have dived in to find them. I'd never have guessed it, but as we walked towards the canal together, a crisp one hundred euro note in my pocket, I realized that I'd found another way to monetize the podcast. As the summer rolled around, I found that there were more tourists who wanted to see my Paris, which was incredibly flattering. It wasn't really something I advertised. I didn't want to be a tour guide after all. But when people came looking for it, I was ready with a plan and a price. I developed a circuit around the Marais and the Canal, where I'd tell the stories behind my shows, the places that I found interesting in Paris. You know, the kind of places where you could find crocodiles, 
if you believe those kind of stories. Chapter 6.4, Finding Mary. In this chapter, you're going to hear an extra voice. It's my little brother, Eddie. Hi. The guest star of this chapter. It's a kind of an important one. I think the most important, well, for <laughs> me at least. <laughs> so, you guys are going to hear his voice throughout reading his own lines, obviously. Anything you want to add before we get started? No, I'm just really excited to get into it. All right. Well, let's do it. Will you hang around at the end of this little chapter? I can stick around. Okay. And are you going to be here while I'm reading the other bits as well? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Well, feel do you free. Want, do you want, uh, like, laughter through those as well? Or? If there's a funny bit. Okay. Otherwise, uh, zip it. Okay, can do. Here we go. 6.4, Finding Mary. I suppose now... <clears throat> what? Your voice is weak. Keep this in. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose now is as good a time as any to tell the story of when I first came to Paris. I was in my early 20s and I'd been traveling through Eastern Africa. I was on the tightest of tight budgets and I arrived in London with just 20 pounds in my wallet. The rest of my family got to London at around the same time as I did for a big family reunion a few days down the line and it was decided that I should take my little brother Eddie to Paris. He'd been learning all about the City of Light at school and was desperate to see it with his own eyes. I was hesitant at first. You see, he was 12 years old at the time, a young 12 by all means, and I was 21. I've no idea why anyone thought it was a good idea to leave Eddie in my hands, but that's what we did. With the Eurostar train far too expensive for our last minute trip, we booked an overnight bus, packed a change of clothes, and arranged a bus ticket back a day later. All we'd need is to find a place to stay overnight. Before we left, my dad took me aside, gripped me by the arm, and warned me to take good care of my brother. Oliver, you just remember, Eddie's only small, he's only 12 years old, you make sure you look after your brother. I'm not even sure, I'm really, do you really think it's, I'm not sure that it's a good idea. Ruth, he's old enough, he's travelled around the world for God's sake. I know, but Eddie's, he's a little boy. You make sure that you stay warm and you make sure that he's got plenty to, do you know, the more I think about this, the more I think it's not a good idea. Oliver? We're trusting you. Look after your brother, okay? Mm. Got it? Yeah. Good. Hold hands. Yeah, yeah, I said. Let's go. We got into Paris on a sunny summer afternoon, and it was like a dream. Now, I don't know what your first ever day in Paris was like, or maybe what it will be like, but ours was glorious and overwhelming at once. We got off the bus from London and hit the ground running. We walked until our feet were too sore to continue. We wanted to take it all in. Eddie, lovable Eddie, was beside himself with excitement, and so was I, drinking it up like a chocolat chaud. Look, he said to me as we strolled by the River Seine. Is that the Eiffel Tower? Why, yes, Eddie, I believe it is, I said with a smile, and I ruffled his hair. Boy, oh boy, it's a lot bigger than in my school books. Can we go and see it? Oh, all in good time, Eddie. First, we need to find a tourism office and sort out a place for tonight. We need to sleep somewhere after all. Of course, Oliver, you know what's best, he said, flashing a cherub smile that showed his double dimple. You don't sound very young in this, Eddie. Do you want me to go younger? Do 12. Let me do that again. <laughs> of course, Oliver, you know what's best. No, Eddie. <laughs> Too young? <laughs> Too young. For the next bit, stick to 12. Okay, okay. Now, I was no expert on Paris in those days, but I knew we were near the most beautiful avenue in the world, the Champs-Élysées. And I figured there'd have to be some kind of tourist help there. Plus, I was keen to relax. I was surprised at how daunting the city was, the avenue so grand that it took an hour to walk just down one of them. We crossed the elegant park, the Jardin de Tuileries, and made a beeline towards the Arc de Triomphe. About halfway along, we discovered a little pop-up tourist booth, which looked like it could provide the answer to our questions of accommodation for the night. It was here that I'd meet Mary, a curly-haired, middle-aged French... Well, you're laughing... <laughs> I was just going to say, can I read some? <laughs> yeah, do you want to read some? <laughs> yeah, can I do it? Okay. Yeah, go on. It was here that I'd meet Mary, a curly-haired... Oh, maybe you should do it. <laughs> a curly-haired, middle-aged French woman who didn't seem too impressed with me. I told her that we were looking for a place to stay and she seemed incredulous. She asked how old Eddie was and I said 12. She asked if we had a signed document, private... But, uh, no, you know what? You are actually a lot better at this. Go on. <laughs> okay, I'm taking over, Eddie. She asked how old Eddie was, and I said 12. She asked if we had a signed document proving I was his guardian, and I said no. She asked why I hadn't booked something ahead, considering it was peak tourist season. 
I didn't have an answer. Mary didn't look impressed. Hey, I, I'll be Mary. Are, yeah, you want to be Mary. <laughs> okay, can you do a middle-aged curly-haired French woman? Okay. Um, it's the middle of summer. Your brother it's is a woman. <laughs> Does it all, she also didn't sound curly-haired. <laughs> <laughs> it's the middle of summer. Your brother is underage. You don't have a signed document from your parents saying that you're his guardian. Then she shrugged her shoulders and added, I suggest you find a park bench for the night. Mary wasn't kidding. It was my first true encounter with a French person, and I'm ashamed to admit that like many other tourists, I decided that the stereotype was true. French people were rude, after all. We left Mary in the booth and went to sit on a nearby bench. I needed time to think, and I wanted... Could we really sleep on this bench? Really? I wanted how my parents would react. My dad's warning played back in my mind. Look after your brother. Look after your brother. Look after your brother. Yeah, you know him too. Yeah. I felt like I'd already let him down. I wondered how Eddie would react. I looked at his little 12-year-old face, his freckled cheeks, his tired and hopeful eyes. Are we really going to sleep on the bench all? He asked, using the nickname that only my closest friends and family ever use, especially in times of <laughs> tenderness or trouble. I'll do it if you ask me. You know what's best for me after all. By God, that boy knew how to make me feel guilty. Don't worry, Eddie. I'll figure something out. I said, you just lay down on the bench there and rest those sleepy little eyes. While I waited to see if Eddie would fall asleep, I went through all my options. Now, it might not sound like such a tricky situation to you, but let's get this in perspective here. It was apparently forbidden to stay anywhere with Eddie without the legal consent from my parents, which I wasn't going to get. They were off in Morocco celebrating their wedding anniversary. I couldn't call them. None of us had cell phones. At that time, the internet wasn't even a remote possibility for us or them. I thought about forging something, but then remembered that everything was apparently booked. Everything cheap, anyway. I certainly couldn't afford anything expensive. And no, I couldn't whip out a credit card because I didn't have one. And Eddie didn't either. Nowadays, it'd be easy, I'm sure. But at that moment, I didn't know what to do. I looked over at Eddie, laying on the green bench, dozing off as the last rays of sunlight filtered through the Arc de Triomphe in the distance. I thought of my parents, and how disappointed they'd be with me for making Eddie sleep on a bench. Night was starting to set in, and there was a rat-like rustle coming from a nearby bush. Several rat-like rustles, in fact. I was astonished to see the first rat, poking its head out of the foliage and apparently sizing up Eddie's ankle, then retreating to wait for nightfall. I don't know what prompted my next act, and it may well have been the rats, but I gave up. I went back to Mary in the booth, and I brought Eddie along with me. Eddie, we have two options, I said as we approached. Option one, you turn those doe eyes up a notch and we charm this lady into helping us somehow. I don't know what she can do, but she's our only hope. And what's option two, all? He said, his lip quivering. We sleep on the bench and get eaten alive by the Paris street rats. <sighs> Say it ain't so. <laughs> we went back to the booth and I went through the options again. And to my dismay, Mary made it sound even harder than she had at first. After I'd all but exhausted my list of questions, I asked the last one I had. Mary, what would you do if you were me? She looked at Eddie, sweet Eddie, with dirt on his cheeks and what appeared to be a tear in his eye. <laughs> Shall I do Mary here? Uh, yeah, I'll let you go. How old is the boy again? That sounds like my Mary. <laughs> we, this is dramatic. Let's okay, get this okay. right. <laughs> How old is the boy again? The boy is 12, I said, and a young 12 at that. She looked from Eddie to me and then back to Eddie again. She sighed. It was a long sigh. <laughs> Are we doing line for line? I like that. It's like an acrostic poem. Yeah, then there was a long pause. Time stood still. Well, that would have been my line. <laughs> I forgot we were doing it. It felt like the traffic on the champs of Lise disappeared. It was just me and Eddie and Mary as she decided what to tell us. It felt like she had the keys to the city, the insight, the context. Whatever she would say next would be our fate, and I was hoping she wouldn't repeat her line about the park bench. The sun had set by this point, and I, my beloved little... Oh, it kind of doesn't work. <laughs> the sun had set at this point, and Eddie, my beloved little brother, let out a little shiver. <laughs> I put my arm around him. It felt like it might have been that little shiver that changed everything, creating ripples that radiated despair and hopelessness through the air, reaching Mary and warming up her Parisian heart. Alors, 
she said, shaking her head. My son is twelve. I wouldn't want him sleeping on a bench in Paris. I suppose you two will have to sleep at my house. Come along, I'm closing up anyway. What? Her house? Good Lord, what a gesture. Here I was thinking she had a connection with a hotel or a backpackers and was going to put in a good word for us. We couldn't believe our luck. Mary, who at first had seemed like the most heartless woman in Paris, had transformed into a guardian angel. She locked up the tourist booth and led us through the cobbled roads of the 8th arrondissement. We rode a train to the western suburbs where we spent the night with Mary and her lovely family in their wonderful home overlooking Paris. Her husband was delighted to meet two Australians and we traded stories about our life on respective sides of the world. The 12-year-old French boy gave Eddie some comic books while I drank wine with the adults. We got a true insight into Parisian family life, maybe better than any I've had in the years that I've lived here since. In the morning, Mary sat down with us and pulled out a map of the city. Now, you've only got one day here, so here's how to spend it, she said. She's a little German. Did I mention yeah, that? Yeah, I like that. I, mine was. Too. She had some formal that written? in Germany. <laughs> I didn't write that. That's an extra it's for important. the audio experience. <laughs> so here's how to spend it, she said, marking with a pen the exact routes that we should take and the sites we should see to maximize our time. It was clear that this was her job and she knew all the secrets. It was the perfect mix of tourist attractions and hidden gems. She told us how to avoid the queues at the Eiffel Tower and the best bateau mouche barge from which to see the city. And as a last surprise, she took us to the local bakery and plied us with pastry treats to take with us, then sent us on our way. It was amazing. We were well fed, well rested, and had the itinerary of an expert to lead us on our way. And so on that second day... It was even more wonderful than the first. It was like a movie montage with Eddie and I ducking and diving, smiling and laughing, riding boats and climbing towers until it was time to head back to London, drunk on the magic of Paris. Wow. Do you want to read a bit? Yeah, give me a go. It was to be my first lesson in Paris know-how. Mary taught me that Paris doesn't have to be daunting and unmanageable. All you need is a few tips and a place to sleep, of course. Funnily enough, years later, giving tips about Paris and helping tourists ended up being my own job. Or your own job. I sometimes wonder if I'll pay back the accommodation favor somewhere down the road to another pair of underprepared travelers. As for me and Eddie, when we got back to England, our family sat dumbstruck when we told the story. But my favorite part of it didn't happen for another ten years. One decade later, Ed of... (laughs) That's not my name. <laughs> you idiot. One decade later, Eddie visited me in Paris. We were reminiscing about that fateful weekend, Mary, and the City of Light. We hadn't discussed the story for years, and being in Paris together brought the memories flooding back. Wouldn't it be amazing to find Mary again? Eddie said, shaking his head with a smile and wiping <laughs> croissant crumbs from his chin. This is now, this isn't a, uh, Baby Eddie anymore. No, I had to change my voice. You see what I did there? <laughs> I noticed that you changed I'm an actor. <laughs> but you're not doing your current voice because you're still a bit younger. Yeah, I, no, I, I think they'll notice. Yeah, I they'll took notice it back. It. Okay. Do you want to do the line again? I'd love to, actually. Yeah, go on. I Would- want to see the nuance. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing to find Mary again? Eddie said, shaking his head with a smile and wiping croissant crumbs from his chin. That's it. What an idea. Let's do it. I was always on the hunt for a good story, and we had one in our lap. We decided that we had to make it our mission to find Mary, one decade on, and to thank her for her hospitality, not to mention for giving us both a story that we'd retold endlessly over the years. And what better way to document the journey than to record it all as a podcast episode? We didn't have our contact details, however, and we spent four days retracing our steps, looking for clues, and searching all over the internet for the elusive Mary. I emailed every account that seemed to be tied to her, reached out to her on every social media profile, but to no avail. The French are notoriously private online. Many of my own French friends have fake names on Facebook. Maybe Mary had a fake profile too. We enlisted the help of a beginner tarot card reader (laughs) and almost hired a private detective until he told us his astronomical fees. It was a cracking ride, and eventually, by looking at old blog entries and photos, we traced the story from the Champs-Élysées to the Paris suburb of Courbevoie, right up to the exact apartment building we'd spent the night. We even rode all the way out there on the scooter, but there was no Mary in sight. The lobby was open, and we scoured the names on the intercom dials, but nothing seemed to match. As a last resort, we stood out on the street and looked to the balcony on the top floor, the balcony that featured in our photographs all those years ago, 
and we saw an open door. It was our last hope. I asked Eddie to yell out for Mary, to call her name into the Paris skies like a young Australian Romeo. A Hail Mary, if you will. And, just like ten years before, he looked into my eyes and said, You know what's best for me, all. I'll do it. I fed him the lines, and for this audio experience, I'll do it much like it was rather than it is in the book. Ready? Yell out, Mary. Mary! It's all over and Eddie. It's Oliver and Eddie! The two young Australians. The two young Australians! That you looked after. That you looked after! Ten years ago. Ten years ago! I was twelve. I was twelve! A young twelve. A young twelve at that! And we're here. And we're here! Seeking salvation. Seeking salvation! Do you read me, Mary? Do you read me, Mary? I love you. I love- <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I admit I got carried away with the last bit, but it was clear Mary wasn't there. She'd probably long since moved away. We're on a wild goose chase. And while it made for a fun podcast episode, the hunt for Mary ended in failure. Eddie was despondent. I was. But I told him that Mary would have been happy anyway. In our search for her, we'd scooted across the whole city. And in a roundabout way, we'd experienced the true Paris. We'd met the locals, passed countless tourist hotspots, and we even dared to cross the Paris ring road to get a taste of suburban life. I released the episode about our journey, and judging by the response, I disappointed a lot of listeners by the fact that we never found Mary. It was disappointing for me, too. I'd always hoped to be reconnected with her. Many months later, I got an unexpected email from a woman called Mary. The Mary. Our Mary. She'd checked her old email account, seen my messages, followed the links, and she'd found our podcast episode. She'd listened with her whole family. The same family who'd taken us in a decade earlier. As I read her message to myself, I was terrified that she was going to be unhappy or uncomfortable with being the subject of an episode. But it was rather the opposite. Oh, it was wonderful, she wrote, adding how pleased she was to get her 15 minutes of fame. Or as she called it, her fameur quart d'heure de gloire, which I much prefer. We sometimes talk about you two, too, she added. You can't imagine what a delight you were to have around. I'm so happy you came to the tourism office that day and didn't sleep in the wild. She's still German. She's still got a bit of a... (laughs) It's not going to change. That's who she is. (laughs) She added that she had left Paris for a quieter life in the south of France. A life where she didn't feel like she needed to take pity on orphan tourists, no doubt. I've never made it to her corner of France and she hasn't been back to Paris. But I hope one day to meet Mary once more and to thank her for one of my most memorable nights in Paris. So there you go. Oh, there you go. What did you think of that? I liked it. You enjoyed it? Yeah. What did you guys think of it? (laughs) No, but you leave a pause so they can respond. (laughs) They can respond out loud on the train. Exactly. Um, Train. Yeah, people are going to be listening on the train. I pictured them in cars. Really? Yeah, like driving to like like, um, an appointment. Probably, yeah. yeah. They might be stopped in their... Uh, At a red light. No, no, I was oh. going to say in their garage back home. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just waiting like, for the episode or the chapter to, to finish. Exactly, oh, exactly. Love that. But the chapter's finished and I figure Eddie and I will just hang around for a quick minute to chat about it. Mm. A little behind the scenes, if you will. What was going through your minds as we were reading that? It was. I was actually thinking mostly about when we recorded the podcast episode and couldn't stop laughing as we did it. And I, I was kind of that impressed too. that we managed to go through this whole thing. That's without something I, ne- I never released that. Um, oh goodness! Uh, It'd be a the very long reel. episode. You but should one day. I hope that everyone's listened to that episode because it's really cool. It's called Finding Mary. Way back. It's not ago. called that anymore. No, I think I changed the name of it. Back. Yeah. What is it called? It's called uh, My First Time in Paris. Okay. So this is an episode from years ago. It's probably from 2018. I'd say. Yeah. And when Eddie and I were recording the last bit, the bit that we just talked about where it's like, miraculously, we'd, uh, we discovered Paris, <laughs> the true meaning of, the Paris, true yeah. meaning of our trip. It. And when Eddie and I were recording it, we were oh, dying of laughter. It took us like an hour. Yeah. We were late to wherever we had to go because yeah. we couldn't get it done. And the reason was, is I, I added a line in there that was, um, <laughs> Uh, it was it was a bit about how you were asleep, and yeah. I came in and watched you sleep for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and the line was something like, "That night I was watching Eddie sleeping when I when I realized that we'd uh, seen the true Paris." Totally, it was when you found the moral. Of That's the right. Story. The moral of the story to that podcast <laughs> took us an hour to do, it. and nev- I never script the podcast, so that was a kind of a. And yeah. never have since, and that's probably why. That was real. Yeah, it's too. That's why I was wondering. I was like, if we have to stick to a script, who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, but I think we did quite well. I think it was good. But um, 
maybe uh, one last reflection from you, Eddie, about uh, first trips to Paris and how important they can be? Ooh. Um, I would say be prepared, but at the same time, don't. Yeah. So kind of uh, be a little prepared? I think the same thing. I you know what I mean? It's really nice to come to Paris without... Sounds stupid, but... Maybe for accommodation, you should prepare. Okay, book a, book a place to stay, but don't book anything else. How yeah. about that? There you go. Good tip. And I do that everywhere, not just Paris. But am I allowed to talk about other cities? No, not okay. on this audio well, experience. Don't worry. Then. I thought about something when we were reading it about how you... um, The bit about... How one day I'd smile kindly on travelers mm. who've got nowhere to stay. And I thought how you're staying with me right oh, now. Oh, yeah. Karma repay. <laughs> I wonder if, no, that doesn't count. I wonder if I'll ever do it then. How about that? I hope so. The other thing I thought about is when you said that we went to the uh, tarot card reader and then we went to the detective and he had astra. Astronomical. Yeah. And I was like, if he has astronomical fees, does the tarot reader have <laughs> astrological re- fees? <laughs> That's really good. Thanks. I wish you'd help me write the book. <laughs> That's enough from Eddie. You might feature later in the book uh, in a wedding scene. <gasps> what? I don't think you I have any even lines. know about this. I don't know if you have any lines. I'll add them. So everyone uh, at home. That's the end of Eddie. All right. Enjoy the rest of the book. <laughs> but it's not the end of me. You've not seen the last of me. The Cheese It was a warm April night in Paris, and I was sitting in a pool of what may have been someone else's sweat. I'd just finished another basketball game in the secret Marais League, and was hanging out courtside with two guys from Normandy. (sighs) You guys gonna play next week? I asked. Uh, next week is a mois de gruyere. There won't be much basketball, responded Mathieu, a gentle giant of a Frenchman. I gave him a blank look. Uh, a mois de gruyère? I asked. Yes, a gruyère month, he said. There are so many public holidays in May that it's like a gruyère cheese, full of holes. Ah. I apologize that my knowledge of French cheese still wasn't at the level where I used it to describe calendar months. Ah, mais non, Oliver, he said. Gruyère isn't a French cheese, it's Swiss. Don't tell me you don't know your French cheeses. Arno, the other basketballer, leaned in, eyeing me up with suspicion. No point lying, I figured, and admitted that I was more or less clueless. So what do you buy when you go to the fromagerie? asked Arno, the slightly less towering Norman. I told him the truth. Ever since my humiliating failure at the fromagerie when I first moved to Paris, I'd been too scared to venture inside another cheese shop again. If I wanted cheese... I got it from the supermarket. It was almost as if I'd offended them personally. They threw their hands in the air and scoffed loudly. Oh, think of what you've been missing out on for two years. This won't do. You can't live in France without knowing the French cheese. Soon you'll tell us you don't know French wine. I let my silence do the talking, and it wasn't long before it was decided. The mammoth Norman basketballers would be my culinary gurus. If you're going to live in France, they said, you need to have a good grasp of the cheese and the wine. And they were going to teach me. On Tuesday the next week, there was a knock at my front door and the Normans lumbered in, arms laden with heavy bags. I was ready with a few glasses of cider from Normandy, which they took with great pleasure. In an attempt to make them feel at home, I pointed out that I'd even brought back a bottle of Calvados, an apple brandy, after a recent trip to their region. They beamed with pride. They cleared our kitchen table, a small square-shaped island in the middle of the room, and took to laying out various cheeses and bottles of wine with great care. All the while, they were particular about me and Lena staying out of the way and leaving them to it. They argued between themselves in angry whispers, apparently about where some of the cheese should go on the table. Eventually, they invited Lena and I to join them, and what they'd done was incredible. The table was covered with cheeses of every shape, size, and color imaginable but I still couldn't figure out why they'd been so careful with the placements. It seemed haphazard, unusual. Hello, mes amis. Welcome to the cheese and wine map of France, said Mathieu with a grin. This table is France, yes? We are here, in Paris, he said, pointing vaguely to the top middle section of the table. This is north, this is south, yes? Anna said. Right, now listen, we're going to teach you all you need to know about cheese, and we're going to explain your dinner. 
With great pride, the two Normans picked up each piece of cheese, told us its name, explained the region it was from, made us smell it, then placed it back on the table. They took special pride as they showed the Camembert, which is perhaps the most famous cheese from their beloved Normandy region. Then, they did the same thing with the wine, with some familiar names like Bordeaux and Burgundy, set clearly in their geographical homes on the table, alongside other red wines with names I'd not heard before. Now, let's get started. We then proceeded to eat the entire table full of cheese. They taught us how to slice it, the stories behind the cheeses, and for what occasions we should buy them. It was fascinating. Some of the cheeses I'd heard about before, but most were new and wildly exotic. There was a Tombe de Savoie, a mild alpine cheese that became an instant favourite. There was a Timanois from Brittany, a cow's milk cheese made by monks. There was a Crottin de Chevignol, a tasty goat cheese from the Loire Valley, and a semi-hard blue cheese from Auvergne called Fourme d'Ambert. The most visually impressive was the Coeur Neufchâtel, which was shaped like a heart and is said to be one of the oldest cheeses in France. There was also a particularly stinky Munster Ferme from Alsace, so soft that it was almost liquid. The basketballers took great care to explain exactly how to order the cheese too. There's nothing to be scared of, they said. Don't hesitate to tell the fromageur if you only want a little, and don't be afraid to ask questions, because it'll often lead to a free tasting sample. Now, this lesson, as you may imagine, wasn't rushed. My friends went into great detail. They truly wanted me to understand and appreciate this integral part of life in France. And as the hours passed, we also managed to drink all the wine. Let me tell you, those Normans could drink. And as a grateful host, I did my best to keep up with these monstrous obelixes, and I'd done pretty well, if I'm honest. But I must admit, as my bedtime approached, I was glad when the last bottle was emptied. I couldn't have managed another drop. All on a Tuesday, too. It was around this point that Mathieu's eyes started scanning the room. Now, what were you telling us about that bottle of Calvados? Ah, merde. 6.6. Faking French. When I was a boy, my mum convinced me and my brothers that she could speak French. With the fluency of a Parisienne, she would burst into a dramatic flurry of what sounded to us like perfect French. How did she learn it? Why did she learn it? We never thought to ask. We were just impressed by this amazing talent. It wasn't until many years later that we learned she'd been... (gasps) Faking French. I suppose for us children, the idea that someone could fake a language by imitating the sounds was a foreign concept, for the want of a better word. But she fooled us all right. Looking back, I can still remember the noises she made. A lot of j sounds. You know, the j in je m'appelle. There were a lot of soft p sounds too, like the p, pom, pom in the word pomp. I suppose there was a lot of je pom, la la la, ooh la la, and so on. In fact, as I'm making this audio experience, I can just picture the sound of my mum doing it. Je l'ai de toi, le coton droit, du ne va pas pas. Ah, yes, that's it. She was quite convincing. She even had the shrug and the hand gestures. I sometimes wonder if it was my mum's impression that got me hooked on French, or at least on fake French. At the very least, I'm certain she got me into my fascination with languages and accents. And believe me, I am fascinated by accents. When we drove across America, my biggest pleasure was hearing how people's accents seemed to change with every state. I still wish I'd documented it somehow. Anyway, now I was in Paris and thinking of ways to give the podcast a bigger following. I had no budget, which by now should be such a familiar plot to you that I hardly need to mention it anymore. Essentially, I was thinking of ways to promote my show for free. I reflected on the viral video I'd done in Sweden, the one about the sharp intake of breath to say yes. (gasps) 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 If millions of people would watch a video about that language oddity, then surely I could create something similar in France. But in Sweden, I'd had the luxury of a camera operator, an editorial team, and a video editor. Now, I only had myself, an iPhone, and a girlfriend. If I was going to do a video, it would have to be with the minimum amount of equipment and technical expertise possible. While I couldn't think of a language quirk that would match the one in the Swedish video, I suppose I inadvertently took inspiration from my own mum and filmed a short clip about how to fake a French accent. I mulled over the script for a week or two until I had perfected it, then waited for a day with blue skies to film it. And one brisk day, while passing the Eiffel Tower on foot, 
I decided it was go time. Lena held the camera and I spoke for 67 seconds, all in one take so I wouldn't have to edit it afterwards. And this is what I said word for word with this audio taken from the video. Okay guys, here's how to imitate a French person in four steps even when you can't speak French. First, you've got to imitate a horse. So with your lips, it helps if you, if you lift your shoulders a bit and look confused. Second, imitate a monk. I don't really know what a monk sounds like, but I know they sing a lot, like this. Uh, remember that sound. Whenever you're lost for a sound or a word, do that. Uh, three, this is one you might not have heard before. Chi Chi, Metro Map. You need to learn two or three little stations and say them every now and again. You'll sound really French, so. Sentier, le Jaurès, le Rochechoir. Last step, fourth, most important, learn the French swear word putain, which means kind of like whore, and just say it all the time. Putain, putain. Mix all four of these together, you don't even need to learn French, and then you're speaking French. I'll explain. Uh, oui, uh, putain, uh, c'est barbez roche uh, Sentier, uh, putain. Uh. <laughs> you'll be speaking French in no time, give it a try. That was it. Now, that last sentence doesn't look particularly French if you read it, but when you say it out loud with just a little lilt like I did, Barbès Rochechoir, then I guarantee if you try it, people will turn to you and say, My God, I didn't know you spoke French. Try it. Okay, maybe not. But one thing I do know is that there was a truth to my observations, because when I uploaded the clip to Facebook, all hell broke loose. The views instantly started to rack up. You know you're onto something when the first thousand come quickly. And remember, at this time I didn't have a strong following online. The show was still quite new. But people were finding the video and they were sharing it. While the views kept racking up, the shares were flying in at an unheard of rate, for me at least. 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 shares. If you consider that was just the number of people sharing it, imagine how high the view count was. It was unbelievable. It had worked. 67 seconds of me faking a French accent was getting passed around online quicker than I could keep up with it. I started getting messages from friends in Paris and around the world who'd found the video. French people were extremely vocal with their thoughts on the imitation, and most seemed to find it pretty spot on. By the end of the day, I had to turn off all notifications from Facebook because it was getting shared so much. Before that day, I'd taken great pleasure to read every comment that anyone had ever left. Heck, I even responded to them all. And I did it on this video too, but only for the first 10 comments or so. After that, it was madness. The views just kept soaring. 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 hits. It was around this point that other pages started downloading it to their computers, then re-uploading it to their own channels. I started to see it popping up everywhere as people started sharing their pirated versions, some with subtitles for foreign languages. Yes, it burned too fast and it got away from me. I'd predicted this might happen, so I added text to the video mentioning the Eiffel Tower, and I'm glad I did. As my video reached the 1 million view mark on Facebook, I saw that other versions of my video were flying even higher. One of them is up to 4.5 million hits. But that's fine, it was all just spreading the message. The original version of my video plateaued at about 1 million hits, which I considered to be astronomical. I can't even guess how many people have seen it in total. 10 million? More? Who knows? All I really cared about was that the idea had worked. People who liked what they'd seen were now following my Facebook page, and I never had a boost like it since. On a budget of zero euros, I'd reached millions. When the dust settled, I was left with around 10,000 Facebook followers. To this day, I still meet people who recognize me from that video. I even had a few people quote it to me. An older American guy once crossed the room at an event to speak to me, then said, Barbez Rashishwa, before walking off without another word. As lovely as it was to have a new following, the show was just like the vast majority of other blogs and podcasts out there in that it still brought in nearly no money. In fact, it was actually costing me, considering the hosting fees and the website charges. Still, I figured if I could make millions of people watch something, surely I could make a living out of it. But how? So there you have it. That one was uh, really fun to make, especially the bit with Eddie uh, where we sort of went a little bit off the rails there. And there were probably some voices that you, you maybe even recognize from the podcast, from days of podcast past in there. 
Um, fun. And who'd have thought that the crocodile story would get such legs? In fact, the crocodile story is going to come back in chapter 8 uh, in the form of uh, our honeymoon trip. I won't reveal anything yet, but it was, of course, this Paris crocodile that inspired Kylie, the character that uh, Lena and I created for the children's book we made during the first lockdown in Paris. And, of course, if you want to uh, delve a little bit deeper into that world, you can find that book, plus Paris on Air, plus uh, my guide to Paris, all that stuff. Even even this audio experience, you can find it in full, theearfultower.com slash shop. Check it out. As promised, I said I'd read something out, and here comes an email from Peggy Bruns. She says, Hi, Oliver. I'm one of your Patreon supporters. Thank you, Peggy. And I had bought your book, Paris on Air, when it first came out. Thanks again, Peggy. My husband and I have a summer home in the mountains of northeastern Arizona. Ooh, I can't even imagine what northeastern Arizona is like. I'm, I'm sort of imagining it to be very hot and deserty, but the mountains. I'm going to look that up. Uh, but uh, yesterday when we were driving back up here from Scottsdale, almost a four-hour drive, we listened to the first four chapters of your book. We were so entertained and delighted that the hours just flew by. I just wanted to thank you for the book and for making our trip so enjoyable. Wow, that is so exotic to me, listening to Paris on Air in Arizona. I could never have imagined. Uh, She continues, congratulations again on the birth of Otis. What a special time in your life. Looking forward to your future podcast and also finishing the audio experience. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys at home. She actually wrote audio book, but this, as you know, is an audio experience. Uh, but, uh, thanks Peggy for sending in that message and thanks to all you other guys who have as well. Uh, like I said at the beginning, if you want to do me a favor, leave those kind of comments as a review on the podcast, wherever you listen to them. If nothing else, it'll push down the one star review that someone very angry sent in the other day. Don't leave one star reviews guys. Come on. This is meant to be a fun little community. Leave me something to read and I will read it. Remember, this week there's a beautiful scroll from Eddie for Patreon members. Patreon.com slash The Earful Tower. A real uh, deep dive into this chapter. And of course, you'll unlock something like, I don't know, 100 or 200 hours of extra videos that I made. um, And all sorts of extra stuff too. Check it out. Otherwise, I'll be back again next week for Chapter 7. What's in Chapter 7? Uh-huh. This is uh, when I really start sort of figuring out Paris. It, there's a full story of how I proposed to Lena. There's the uh, when I was teaching at a university, how I brought the podcast along. And it finishes with an almighty wedding, which is a story that uh, I don't think I ever shared on the podcast before. So I'm excited for you to hear that. But that'll do it for me. I'm going to leave you as you are, wherever you are. Maybe you're in uh, Arizona somewhere. Maybe you're on the other side of the world. Let me know. I love to hear from you. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Au revoir.